And if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to James uh, chapter 5. We're going to continue our series through the letter of James all day, every day. And we're talking about what it looks like to live in faith, walking with Jesus every day. What does it look like practically? James is very practical um, in this book. And what we're going to talk about today um, seems sometimes to us uh, can seem very um, not practical. It's, it's very easy to know what to do, but oftentimes it's, it's hard to it's hard to really do it. Um, and, and what we're talking about today, where James goes from what we talked about last week, the truthful speech, just one verse we looked at last week, to he moves into um, what what our CSB Bible that we read from here calls effective prayer or useful prayer, prayer that is useful. And this is what we believe, and this is the title of today's message. Prayer is useful. It works. Prayer works. But here's the deal, man. Often, oftentimes, we approach prayer as if it's, we just come to it flippantly. We just come to it flippantly. I don't know if anyone else heard that, but that was buzzing and it was right in my ear. He wasn't lying, Sue, earlier. It's right there. We come to prayer flippantly oftentimes as if it's a, not thoughtfully, as if it's a side note. I don't know. It may be, prayer is hard sometimes, isn't it? It's just hard. You know, if people are like, oh, you just talk to you me to people. We're like, when they pray, it's like God's right there in front of them. I, I, the lady we support down in, uh, down in Honduras, Rhonda, she's like this. And I, I can't wait for you guys uh, in, in, over Thanksgiving break. Um, uh, five of her kids are going to stay with us over Thanksgiving break. They're going to be at church. and They were raised in Rhonda's home. And so you guys are going to get meet some of them. They play soccer down in Rhonda College now. And so they needed somewhere to stay. So we're going to house them. And so you'll get to meet them. But they were raised in a woman's house that, like, y'all, like, listen to this woman when she prays. It's like she's got the red phone, you know, that, like, boom. It's like, God's like, which one, Rhonda? Which need? Girl, I got you. I remember we were there one time. Uh, I was serving down there, and uh, the, the, she had the bus, and they, they, they go out, I mean, they're in the middle of Honduras, man, and, uh, uh, and around the town called Siguatepeque, and uh, check it, check it, Siguatepeque, what's up? That's what they say there. Um, and so uh, they would, they go out, and they pick up all these kids who got a school there, an orphanage, and uh, they go, they take the school bus out in the middle of nowhere and pick up these kids, man. Franklin, one of the kids that'll be up here, he's, he's not a kid anymore, but I mean, he was like, this big, he's in college now, but uh, he's, he's, if I'm not mistaken, it was five, I'm going to give the conservative estimate, it was five miles one way to jump on the bus. He'd walk through the jungle uh, uh, to get to the road where they would pick him up so he could go to school, because it was in a rural area where... I'm really in Honduras, mostly kids don't go to school unless they live in the city and they can go to school. But you live out in rural areas, no school. So she's she's specifically going to these rural areas picking up school. And the school bus, so long story short, school bus, man, the tires just, you know, I mean, it's just rough roads, rough place, tires. They're going through tires like left and right. They were out tires, and they're like, man, we're like, we need we need some tires. We got to fly that day. And she's like, all right, kids, get all the kids from the horse fishing. She's like, all right, y'all, come around. We need tires. So we're praying that's the Lord. We need tires. And uh, so they prayed, and, you know, all the kids, and they prayed, and they're doing everything again. And, yeah, they prayed, and, you know, she's like, all right, let's go do it real quick. It's all good. They, they don't have to, we're good. We're good. Everything's going to be okay. And then sure enough, like, like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, here comes this dude in a pickup truck. I don't, listen, she doesn't live in the city. She lives, like, way off out of the city, like, off the city. The guy pulls up, and he's got, he's got a bed full of bus tires. I'm not kidding you. It's like, it's weird. All right. <laughs> So truck full of he's like he's like hey we got we got all these bus uh, bus tires in today we can't use them somebody told me about you so we decided to bring one up here she was like that's great we need we pray for tires today but the problem is we don't have anybody who can take bus tires I mean their their wheels are like those like butterfly wheels or something like that they're really dangerous like to take apart apparently I don't know me and Ben were there and she was like can you guys put them on we're like uh, no we can do IT work. <laughs> no, but taking those tires off, no. And he was like, oh, yeah, I brought all my supplies and took the tires off for you, too. The same day, same day, guys. Like, same day. This one was just bread pumps. Jesus is what we need. It's like, all right, I got you. Just wait. Just let it be right there. That's how I'm in. But most of us, it ain't like that, Ron. Most of us, it ain't like that. Most of us, when we, we're just like, man, like, prayer can, 
It's, it can honestly just be strange sometimes, isn't it? It can be strange. God, what is this? Especially if you're new to faith. You don't, you don't know Jesus or anything like that. You hear believers talking about prayer. You're like, what are you talking about? But there's also another sense in where like, prayer is like this thing that goes across people too. Like, even people who think it's weird, they're still like, yeah, pray for me. Yeah, I can use some prayer. Or they'll like, pray to other things or whatever. And so, prayer is challenging. It can be mystical. And then, we can be doubtful. We can, we, it, it's easy to just, like, be flippant or doubtful with our prayer. Like, yeah, God, this is what I mean. And, oh, you, you don't have a lot of faith. There's not a, let's say it this way. There's not a lot of anticipation or expectation in our prayers. It's just like, ah, we're praying because that's where we're supposed to be. And in this text that we're going to read, it talks about a prayer of faith. I'm going to explain more what that means and what it doesn't mean. But the point is, I find prayer hard sometimes, and I'm not always the best at it. And if you're like me, you would probably nod your head and say, yeah, me too. I can, I can certainly get pray better at prayer. And so we come to what this text says. James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5. Verse 13, if you dare, say word. word. Let's get into the word so the word can get into us. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Now, when you hear that, you're like, that's the example, you know, Rhonda, Elijah. You're like, yeah, okay, well, that's Rhonda, that's Elijah, but that's not my prayer life. Right? But how, how about we just trust the Word of God and say, you know what, this is what God says about prayer. This is what God says about prayer, that prayer is powerful. Prayer is useful. It works. It works. So the first thing, point number one. When you're down, the best place to be is down on your knees. That first verse, it says, is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you suffering? Ah. Now, this word suffering, it, uh, it literally means like to endure evil. To endure evil. Um, and this could be in, in two things. Me and Vincey were talking about this this week. And, um, I spent time in, in Washington, D.C. this weekend. Uh, um, in, in, at, a, at a conference, and they were talking about world missions and, and, and reaching the unreached people groups of the world. Three billion people right now unreached, no access to the gospel at all. Three billion people on our watch. Three billion people, no access to the gospel on our watch. And so, many of them are living in places where the evil that they're enduring is straight up persecution. The little bit of Christianity that is in these areas, they are massively being persecuted. When, when they are baptized in the name of Jesus, they're ripped from their families. They're, it literally turns family against family, moms against fathers, daughters against dads, so on and so forth. Real persecution. Enduring. Any of you in those situations should pray. But also, Mitzi gave this language to me this week. She was like, so, and I can't remember who she said shared this with her, but that she talked about, we don't face persecution here in America, and I would absolutely say that's wholeheartedly true, but we do experience pressure. Pressure from the world, the, the flesh, and the, and, and the adversary, the devil. We experience those pressures and, and those things we need to endure. Those are evils that we have to endure, that we have to think about. They're pressures on us 
from the exterior to buy into the lies, whether it's lies about identity or lies about what our, our culture and our communities should look like and what is right and what is wrong. These pressures, we have things that we must endure in this world. Amen. We all, listen, if we came up here and begin to list out and lay out before the Lord the things that we've endured here, we would have things that we could lay out. And do. Man, it, my dad was, uh, I remember him preaching a message. He was talking about, um, he said, he said, I think he even practically did this. He said, I want everybody to make a list of the things that you're going through in your life that are that is suffering. Whatever it looks like, pressure that, that you're experiencing. He's like, I want you to make a list of those things. And then every, he had everybody in the church make a list, and they brought it up here and put it on the, on the altar. And then he made everybody in there come back up and pick up somebody else's. And he said, this is the deal. Almost every time when you pick up somebody else's, you read what they're going through, you're like, oh, I'll take my back. Right? Like, I'd rather, have, I'd rather have what I was going through than that. The point is, man, we're all, we're all going through things, not only here, not only within our church body, but all across the world. All across the world, we are enduring evil. But it also means, the suffering means to be demoralized. It has this aspect of like being, having the breath knocked out of you, right? You ever had those experiences where you were just demoralized? I remember when I was um, eighth grade playing baseball, baseball was life. Baseball was life. That was for me, man, eighth grade. I'm just telling you. And I remember specifically a tournament towards the end of the summer playing in Fountain City. And I had the worst tournament of my life. I mean, I was playing short stuff. So I, I don't think I made a play the entire time. Every ball that was hit to me, I booted it. I right threw it over the fence, took the first baseman. I mean, it was horrible. I was just, and then, you know, my game was so I couldn't hit the ball. I just, it was horrible. I went like 0 for 25 or something. And, and just I, 14 errors in two games. It was atrocious. Listen, I've never played that bad in my life. And I remember just coming away from that, just literally just like wanting to just quit baseball altogether. Like a sport that I love. I was just like, I'm, I don't even want to do it anymore. And I was in baseball, and you know, baseball's important, and don't get me wrong, like sports are, can be very, but you ever been in that place spiritually? You ever been in that place in your life? Where it's just, you feel like the breath's been knocked out of you, that you just, you feel demoralized, you just don't want to go on? And sometimes it can, it's the most outrageous, like, if someone else was looking from the outside in, they would be like, why are you feeling that way? Think about Elijah. He comes off Mount Carmel, Calls down fire from heaven, right? Puts, the, puts all the priests and prophets of the false god on blast. This right there is. Get you some. Who's Yahweh? This one is. This is Yahweh. The God of Israel is Yahweh. And then you just a couple of verses. And he's like, laid out by a river. Like, not a, he doesn't just want to not go on in ministry. Like he doesn't, he doesn't even want to go on in life. Elijah, how could you be there after that? Sometimes our hardest, our hardest valleys come right off the mountaintops. They're just, pfft. I'm going to tell you, I've shared this with some people. I, I know I've shared it. Me and Josh have had conversations around this. Mondays is the worst day of the week for me. Worst day of the week. That's why I love coming in here and Mitzi's smiling face. And she, she's like, oh, yesterday was great. She's always encouraging. Because Mondays is rough. Because Sunday's a great day. And I know God worked, and then the very next day, you know, kind of get spent, you kind of give all you got on Sunday. And then Monday comes around, and it's just like, you know, the devil, the lies, it's like that. You know, I didn't, that didn't nobody listen to. You know, that, that was a really awful sermon, Austin. That was, that was Bush League. That's what we'd say in baseball. That was push it stuff. And all the lies just come in. You're like, man, yesterday was a great day. All of a sudden, how could you feel that way? I know. Sometimes when we're suffering, this enduring 
It's unexplainable. You can't explain it. You ever been there where I, I, I don't know why I feel? There's no reason for me to feel this way. I get it. Like logically, like I understand, but this is how this is my this is my current experience. And all of us have experienced this. See, Satan wants to break your spirit. That's what he wants to do. He wants to break your spirit. It's hard to explain sometimes what that even means, but we've all experienced it. But here's one truth I want you to understand. Our adversary, he's on a leash. He's on a leash. Our God is still reigning and ruling from his throne. Jesus is on the throne. And Job has this question, why is all of this happening? Why am I experiencing this? But God still got him on a leash. And that's a powerful truth to understand. And at those moments when we feel like Elijah, where I'm like, I'm enduring this, but I don't, I don't want to go on. If I didn't ministry, I didn't, maybe, maybe not even alive. Just, and we've all been there in some way, some shape, some form. Man, what do we need to do? We need to pause. No. James says he should pray. Put the brakes on. Sit down. Speak to God. This is exactly what Elijah does. And I love that story. What happens? God comes and says, man, here's some food. Take a nap. He gives him exactly what he's exhausted and he's hungry. And God comes and gives him exactly what he needs. What he, needs. he meets him right there. We need to press pause when these, when these stressors come in our lives. We're just, we, we feel the pressure. We feel the pressure in our society. And we don't want to move on. We need to pause and pray. We need to turn our God because when we do that, it shifts our focus. Right, guys? It shifts our focus. You've been here Wednesday night. We, we change our focus from the problem to gratitude. What do you actually have? Prayerfully, prayerful gratitude is what we're talking about. When you, when you are down and you don't want to go on, get down on your knees and pray and say, God, help me see. I know. I understand. I see the pressures, but I need to see the way you see. And one of those ways that God sees and he understands that our adversary, the one who is against us, listen, he's only being allowed. He's only being allowed. He doesn't have full reign and control. When we think about that, it renews our sense of the world. We have a new way of seeing it. What we've been talking about on Wednesday night it gives us a paradigm shift. We get, we get outside of the cycle that leads to complaining and, and, and frustration and even more stress and more pressure of suffering. I just don't want to go on. It gets us out of that. It locks our eyes on what we actually do have. Because this is the deal. The temptation is, is that misery loves company. You know, we like to bring others down with us. Right? When we're in those moments where we're, we're hurting and we're, we're, we don't know if we can go on, we want to bring, the tendency is to bring others down with us. And James... He's, he's already talked about this in James chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth, brothers and sisters. These things should not be this way. He tells us when we get to that moment, when we get down, don't turn to the grumbling like Exodus chapter 17 and others, but get on your knees. And pray. Prayer is useful. Let me and Elizabeth talk about this all the time. You'll hear me say it a thousand times. If you're here for the next 40 something years, that's how long I plan on being here. Sorry. <laughs> broken people break people. Broken people break people. How many broken people we got in the room? Your hand's not up, use a liar, which just makes you broken. You need to go visit Blasphemy's message. Speak or raise your hand. God says, Yes, that's true. James said, Yes, 
Suffering comes, absolutely. But don't do anything else. Get on your knees. When you're down, get down and pray. It says pray. This word again is draw near. It means to draw near. Why? Why? Because, once again, go back to the very beginning. Sometimes prayer doesn't even feel like it works. Sometimes, right? Is it actually useful? The reason we come at it flippantly is because we honestly, we honestly in the depths of our hearts sometimes don't think that it's useful. That's not going to help matters. Or that what really needs to happen is not that we get on our knees and draw near to God, that we need to step into problem solving mode and fix the thing. Whatever it is. Or just crumble and fall and let life happen. But we are to respond. James addresses this. Why draw near to the Lord? We touched on it a couple weeks ago. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. It says, or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says, the spirit made to dwell in us in these intensely, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who get down on their knees, humble themselves before the Lord. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil. When you draw near to him, he draws near to you. Those who draw near to him, he draws near to them. Why? Get on your knees and pray when you feel down. Because when you draw near to him, he draws near to you. Remember, just a couple weeks ago, I talked about this idea of drawing near. It's, it's, a, it's the idea of that when something is so close that it's, it's, its closeness affects the reality. Jesus, I, I told you this about when Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the last time and sends this to the disciples. He sends them in. And he says, hey, go in there. And, and there's going to be all these things and they're already going to be prepared for you. And they get there and it's already things are already prepared. And, and the idea is that the word it means that like Jesus is so close to Jerusalem that like his authority is already being experienced in Jerusalem. And so when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. And then he, we begin to experience the effects of the nearness of God. And here in a minute, I'm going to read a verse about God's presence and what happens in, in the midst of God's presence. <sighs> Oftentimes, I think we have a real misunderstanding. We get blinded by all of the things and we really miss the grace of God. He says, he gives greater grace. Greater than what? Greater than what you're enduring. Greater than the persecution. Greater than the pressure. Greater than the demoralization of your own heart and the brokenness in you. Greater grace than that. And it comes from His presence. Draw near to Him, He draws near to you. And remember, the church, His presence is what we need more than anything. We can have all the lists and rules. You can be given a piece of paper that it tells you exactly what you need to say and do every single moment of every single day, and you would not be able to do it. It could be laid out, articulated for you, and you would still fail. What we need more than anything is we need the presence of God. Amen? That's the truth, church. We need His presence. This is why we get on our knees and we pray. We draw near because He is near those who draw near to Him. Number two, when you're pumped up, be found praising. When you're pumped up, be found praising. Simply put, the pumped praise. It says the cheerful. Is anyone cheerful? Now, sometimes in life, we're not in that state, are we? Sometimes we're not all demoralized and broken down. Like, I just don't know if I want to go on. Sometimes we're like, I don't care what you throw at me. I ain't stopping. Can't stop, won't stop, baby. Sometimes that is the position of our heart and our soul and our mind. That's where we are at. What do we do in those moments, church? We praise Him. It needs to be encouraged or motivated. I'm going to tell you all. This week, I told you I was in D.C. I spent time. When years ago, 
When I stepped into a Bible study, we opened up a book called Radical, and it radically changed my life. And I heard the first chapter of that book, and I said, if that's what Christianity is, if that's what the book of this book right here is talking about, I'll give my life to that. Without, without a doubt, I will give everything I got. In every moment, I'll do my best to throw it all at that reality. And that book was written by a man named David Platt. I don't care what you think about it, whatever. I don't care if you agree with his doctor, disagree. I don't care. Man, God used him mightily in my life. And every time I hear him speak, boy, it puts a water pistol in my hand. I'm like, hell, come on. Because it takes me back to that moment when God began to seek in me the truth of Scripture. That the calling on the life of the church, every single believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the calling for you is to give your life to the gospel to the ends of the earth. The Great Commission was given to all of us. Take it to the ends of the earth. Three billion people do not have access to the gospel under our watch. They're living in literal hell right now. And what are we doing about it? What if, no, 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 no. Forgive me. What am I doing about it? What am I doing about it? We need to sing. We're ready to go, encouraged, motivated, ready to chase hell down with a water pistol. Lift your voice. What does he say? Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Ephesians 5.19 says this. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making music. And we miss this part. Making music with your heart to the Lord. You know what he doesn't say? Making music with your mouth to the Lord. Because some of us, we, we put the pause on that because we're terrible singers. And God said, I ain't worried about how good you sing. It ain't about, it ain't about how well and the tone and all of that and the rhythm and the melody all of those things and the keys and all that like that's for the guys who get up here and do it because they're really good and they know those things that's for you guys the rest of us we're to sing from our heart so don't not sing because you're not a good singer that's hear me that's unacceptable it's to sing with your heart so if you're like awesome I'm a terrible singer Join me, another terrible singer, who's right down here singing his praises. Here's an area in which I share with our worship team this Wednesday night that I struggle with. Lots of reasons I'm not going to go into all of that. But really singing praises to the Lord and letting go and just... I struggle there. And if I struggle, then, then us as a church will struggle. And so I'm asking for your help in me. When we're worshiping, you know what this brother needs in Christ? You know what spurs him on when I look around and you're getting down with it too. Josh and I talked about this. It's interesting. Sometimes, sometimes the church and brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, we find ourselves at opposed positions in these. Where one week, I'll be broken down, demoralized, don't want to go on. You know, I'm Elijah by the river. And then Josh would be, he'd be juiced up, ready to take on hell with water this long. He'd be like, no. He would, he would encourage me. And then there were days where he was down, and I would come in, and I'm ready to go. Oh, that's why we need it. I'm not going to go on a tangent here, okay? But when he says, is anyone among you? In verse 13, in verse 14, is anyone among you? You know what he's assuming? That you're in community. That you're a part of a local gathering of believers. That you are interacting intentionally with brothers and sisters in Christ. That's all it implied. Is anyone among you? You, you local, you local gathering? That's just a side note. Music with your, from your heart. Don't, don't sit there like a knot on a wall just because you have a bad voice. Join me and we'll sing badly together. When we're broken hearted, we need to be cheerful as a reminder. And when we're cheerful, we need the broken hearted as a reminder. 
helps set things right, see things right in the world. This is a, a big paradigm shift. This is a different way of seeing. You think James doesn't, remember I'm talking, James, it's like he grew up in the house of Jesus. And he did. You can hear Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for, their, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice. Your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's a different way of seeing. It's an understanding the blessing and the cheerfulness you have, should have. And at the same time, at the same time, we live in this tension between the, the mourning and the brokenhearted and the cheerful heart. We have to hang in that balance. And understand, some are mourning and we need to be cheerful to them. And some are cheerful and we need to help them to maybe just slow down and help others. The Spirit leads us in that. to so seeing things through God's perspective. When you praise, it brings things into perspective. It gives you eyes to see the way Jesus sees the world and the way Jesus sees people. More important. When you're pumped up, be found praising. Lift your voice to the Lord. Number three, when you're sick, ask others to pray over you. Once again, this implies that you're in a community, that you have elders. Here, we, just, we believe that elders and pastors are the same thing. You're in a community where there's a pastor over you. It's a shepherd. And this is the thing. Don't, don't be the one who takes this. It's like, you know what? It's good. If I'm sick, let's go to the elders. I don't need nothing else. No, take medicine. Your pastor takes medicine every day that he remembers. I have high blood pressure. Sweat all the time. See me on end. When I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was sharing with our leadership team. It's stressful time in my life, and you know, and Elizabeth asked me, she's like, "What's the last time you took your medicine?" I was like, "I don't recall. I literally could not remember the last time I taken my blood pressure medicine." And she was like, "Oh, the past couple of weeks have started to make sense. You've been real short tempered." That's how I get when my high blood pressure goes up. Your voice is short. I'm not blaming. I should be able to control myself even when my blood pressure is high. But nonetheless, I should take my blood pressure medicine. So what I'm telling you, take your medicine. Go to the doctor. God works through. God works through doctors, and, and He works in miracles. An interesting thing happens here. James connects the sick person to salvation. It says the prayer of faith, after talking about the sick person, it says the prayer of faith will save the sick person. And the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. You see that? There was another time that you saw the sick and salvation tied together. But I'll tell you, the way I have to talk about it is the root crash of Mac carriers. You have these four friends around, pick up this map, and they go, rip open a roof and they drop their buddy down in it who was paralyzed and Jesus says stand up and walk your sins are forgiven wait 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 we're trying to make this guy walk what are you talking about sins for Jesus makes the connection he says what, what, what you're witnessing right now is salvation and I'll show you I'll prove you I'll prove it to you I won't just say it I'll prove it to you by healing this man I'll prove it it's powerful. Mark chapter 2 says, Right away Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, Are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easy. Say it. 
paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mind and walk. But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic to get up and go on. He had a purpose. It's almost like James gets it. He's saying, listen, we have things, health issues, physical ailments, we need healing from. We have spiritual issues that we need healing from. We're sick in two ways. We have sickness spiritually, and we have sickness in a, in a health concept. And we should, we should pray about both of those. That's why then he goes into like confessing your sins with one another. It's like, oh, we we're talking about sick people. It's like, yes! Yes! Sick people! Physically sick! Spiritually sick! That's us! You know, high blood pressure! That's what I encourage you. Whatever ailment you have that you have to take medicine for, pray every day for healing. Pray every day for healing. Don't stop. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I need to start praying every day that I'll be healed from my high blood pressure. And maybe I'll heal me. I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe, maybe the medication is the healing that I'll be healed. He says, prayer of faith. Remember when at the very beginning I was talking about flippant prayer or doubting prayer. It's like, ah, oh, yeah. Or like at the end when like that's the last thing I do. James, here's like, this, this is the first place we go. It's the first place we go. Prayer of faith. Here's the deal. It's up to God who is healed. It's up to us to ask. Period. This is a hard process. That really sounds like if somebody prays in faith, then they're going to be healed. It's not. James is writing this within the context of he knows the Hebrew scriptures. He knows the truth. Up to God. Healing is up to God. It is our men. What we're called to do is ask for healing. I don't, I don't understand why some are and some aren't. I don't understand why. In some situations, people are here. Like, my mom was having my mom. I mean, they, they came in and said, You have cancer. We call her and We're going to pray. We're going to ask for faith. That the Lord here, we're truly going to believe the Lord healed. Healed. They come in like two weeks later. I don't know what we're talking about. There's, no, there's, no, there's no, nothing there. I don't know. You're good. I don't know. You all have experiences like that, I'm sure. Whether it's directly that you know or indirectly. I know one here, Teresa, she had a thing with her leg, I can't even remember it, but I remember she walked in here and, and hurt Edward. Broken about this last year. And, and brothers and sisters, they were sharing it with us, and brothers and sisters in their church, it was like a Wednesday night or something, and, and we just, I said, well, let's pray. And she was like, yeah, y'all pray for me. And I was like, no, let's pray right now. We pull up a chair, we sit right there in the middle, we put our hands on it, and we pray over it. Next time she went in there, they were like, I, it's like, it's not really a big deal. So we'll not take care of this. And it ended up being like fluid or something. And they thought it was really, really bad. It's like, man, it's, uh, it's, not, no, it's not looking good. We have experiences like that. So the question is, like, why? Why sometimes and why not other times? What's the deal? Here's my answer. Here's my theological answer. I don't know. Here's where we just, we listen to Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than yours. And my thoughts than your thoughts. But he, who gets healed is up to him. It is up to us to ask. And this is the deal. What is not a mystery is that God will use it no matter what. Whether one is healed or not, God will use it. That's not a mystery. He promises that. That's true. Let me give you one quick biblical example. Okay. Man, I'm already like, we got like seven more minutes, okay? Alright, just to let y'all know, I'm going, I'm, I'm about to go in. Paul. Acts chapter 7. This guy named Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, shows up and just lays down the gauntlet. I mean, preaches one of the best sermons ever preached. 
And then he stoned to death. And Paul is right there holding the coats of those who stoned. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that day, severe, severe persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. And then verse 4 of chapter 8 says this. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Guess where they go? They go north. Guess where the church in Antioch is? They go to Antioch and they plant a church in Antioch. Now, fast forward to Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Timmy, who was called Niger, Lucius, and Cyrene, Manan, friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. Then, after they fasted and prayed, laid hands on him and sent them off. Do you see what just happened? Paul's persecution of the church, enduring, the church endures it, they scatter, they go plant the church, those who are scattered, go plant a church in Antioch, and three, four, five, six chapters later, that's the church that sends Paul out on mission to the ends of the earth. That is the use of, of what we're suffering and pain and, and, and all these things. Here, God using it for his good and his glory for the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's when you're in that moment, God, why is Stephen being so to, to scatter the church so that a church can be planted in Antioch? And there's coming a day when my boy Paul, who held, who held the jackets, he's going to be launched on a missionary journey out of that church. Amen? That's a promise. Promise. He will work it out for the good of those who are called according to his what? Purpose. When we function towards his purpose, which is the gospel, to the ends of the earth, he will take everything we experience, no matter what type of suffering, no matter what type of cheerful experience, encouraged zeal, he will take it and use it for his benefit for the gospel to the ends of the earth. Period. It's right and true. So we can sit here and we can pontificate and ask questions about, well, why did God heal this one and not this one? All I can say to that is, I don't know, but what I do know is he will use all of those situations to bring about his plans and purposes, which is, again, the gospel to the ends of the earth so that every person, in the end, every name, every, uh, uh, there will be people from every, every tribe and nation singing his praises. So, we ask the question, do our, do our prayers work? And sometimes when some people are healed and some people are not, what happens to the prayers when people are not healed? If we pray for healing over them and they're not healed, this is not the final. It's not the last of the story. Let's flip over to Revelation chapter 8. And right, right before this, chapter 7, verse 9, it says, After this, a look, there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne. Hear me. Like, if we truly believe in what our mission is, that it would be on in Blunt County and this earth like it is in heaven, this is what it's like in heaven. So, when you come in here like a bump, bump on a log and don't worship and lift your voices, you're not being what it's like in heaven. Salvation, they're crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. This is what's happening in heaven. And then in verse 8, you want to know what happens to your prayers? Every prayer. The ones that you see effectual work in this life and the ones that you don't. Check this out. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the angels who stood in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a golden incense burning came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. You hear that? The prayers of the saints. Your prayers are being collected in heaven. They're known, they're heard, and they're being stored up. And then he says this, the smoke of that same incense, the prayers of the saints 
went up before the presence of God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the incense burning, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumbles, flashes of lightning, and earthquake. This is when God begins to purify the earth. He does it, and your prayers are the fuel. So you want to, want to know about healing? Every prayer is stored up. Every healing prayer you pray is stored up. And one day, he's bringing healing. And your prayers are going to be the fuel. I'm coming back to it. And we sit around like a knot on a log in worship. <clears throat> Come on. We have something to praise, church. We have, we have a God who, who listens and stores up every time you come before him. Everything you ask, every time you pour out your heart, every time you're suffering, every time you're cheerful, He takes those and He's storing them up for a day of purification. purification. See this, the prayer of the saints are the fuel for the refining fire from heaven, which purifies the earth and prepares the way for the new heaven and the new earth. Amazing. So my question to you this morning as the band comes, do you need prayer? Say it this way. If you're broken in your spirit, if you're moralized, they're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask you to come. Pray. If that's your position in life, if that's where you find yourself, do not leave this day without getting on your knees. And, and what, when you're down, the best place to be is down on your knees. If you're cheerful, if you're, if you're in a place of praise and feeling juiced up about life and you're, you're ready to advance the gospel in your workplace and the places around you, you're feeling good about it. God's got you in a good place. Great. Yes. Amen. You sit in your seat, stand and sing with a loud voice as they, as they sing in heaven. If you're sick, here's what I want you to do. You're sick. I mean, spiritually or physically, and you need prayer. I'm going to ask you to stick around after the service. So, I believe part of the intention here in James is that this would be done in private, and it's, and it's your job to share that with other people, not mine. So we have two pastors here, me and Tom, and so we will we will take you, and we're going to pray over you. So I'll ask you to come to me. Here's what I know. We must be, be a people who pray and praise. The more we pray, the more we'll see you. Period. The more you pray. I mean, that's like simple math, isn't it? The more you pray, the more we pray, the more we become a house of prayer. The more we'll see people heal. And the more praise that we give, the more motivated we'll be with the gospel. The more praise we give, the more motivated we'll be. Prayer is useful for the broken and the sick, and praise spurs on the body. 